Hi, this is Pastor Philip Nelms of Renaissance Christian Fellowship, and I want to personally welcome you to our podcast channel. We would be honored for you to like and share our podcast channel on your preferred podcast outlet and social media. Thanks for taking time to listen, and I pray you are blessed by today's message. Please stay tuned to the end of the podcast where you can find additional information about this ministry and our teaching resources. I hope you enjoy the message. All right, if you have your Bibles, if you want to turn with me tonight, we're going to start in Romans chapter 4. And I'm going to start with verse 16, and we'll go to verse 21. And I'm going to read this. I believe this is King James. Verse 16 says, Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all of the seed, not to that only which is of the law, in other words, not just to the Jews, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God who quickens the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, in other words, spoken by God to Abraham, and that word was, so shall your seed be. And being not weak in faith... He considered not his own body now dead. Considered not his own body now dead. When he was about a hundred years old, neither the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, what God has promised, he was able also to to perform. And I'll give you one more scripture real quick. It's uh, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left of us entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it. And I'm calling tonight's message going all the way with Jesus, going all the way with Jesus. The scripture calls Abraham the father of faith because Abraham believed what God had promised him in spite of the way that things looked. Abraham and Sarah stood and they believed God for years into their old age. And like that scripture said, they were 100 years old when the Lord gave them this word. But he stood on the promise and he believed God even when the scripture says his, his body was dead. Okay, what that meant is because of his old age, his reproductive ability was now dead. And the same was true for old lady Sarah, his his wife. All right, they were dead in their bodies as far as their natural ability to reproduce. But the promise of God to them was that you'll have a son and your seed, your children, will be uncountable like the stars in the sky. And so even being dead in the body, Abraham chose to believe what God had said. So Abraham never quit on God. Abraham and Sarah believed God and took him at his word. They believed the impossible, even though they were already dead in those parts of their bodies when God spoke this to them. And the word says that Abraham was fully persuaded. He was not half-hearted. He was not double-minded about God's promise. And the scriptures say that Abraham's faith was accounted unto him by God as righteousness. Okay, that simply means that God saw his faith and he said, now this is the right way to do it. Okay, this is what I'm looking for. It was right. And the scripture says Abraham did not stagger. He did not waver. He refused to give up on the promise that God had given him. In verse 18 that we read, it says that against all hope, Abraham still chose to hope. He believed with expectation that what God had spoken to him would come to pass, even if their bodies were already dead. You see, death is not a deterrence to answered prayer. Because Jesus said, I am the resurrection, I am the life. And it is this kind of faith that pleases God. God does not quit on us, and he expects that we won't quit on him. 
He actually trusts us. He believes when he tells us something, he can't doubt. He believes that when he tells us something, we will do it. And so when we see things that are taking longer than we thought it would, and when our plans or when our circumstances don't seem to line up with what God said, God still expects us to believe him. So we know, according to the scripture, faith comes by hearing the rhema word, or in other words, the spoken word of God to us. When God speaks to us, faith gets birthed on the inside of us. See, God's rhema word is the seed that produces faith. But that seed of faith has to be guarded. That seed of faith has to be watched over. Just because you received faith about something that God spoke to you doesn't mean that it still can't be aborted. Your faith will get tested. It will get tried by the enemy. You will be tempted to quit and to give up before the finish line. But when we refuse to quit, we win. See, when God spoke that word to you, he already saw the end from the beginning. He already saw the conclusion. He just needs you to stay in the race. The, a simpler title for tonight's message would probably have just been, don't quit. Don't quit. But people ask questions like, but what if it doesn't happen? Okay, what if I believe God and he lets me down? Okay, but that question in itself demonstrates a person's double-mindedness about God's faithfulness. God is faithful, and he does expect the same from us. So what if you don't see your promise right away? Or what if it's a long time? Or what if it never comes to pass? Well, if you heard God, and you stayed in faith, and you continued to trust God, that's what pleases him. See, we think getting the thing is what makes God happy. But it says it's faith that pleases God. Staying in faith, being faithful, and believing him is what he likes. God rewards the faith. Even if we die, we better die in faith. You don't want to die any other way. So even if you didn't get to see the end of your faith in this life, God still rewards your faith. Faith is an eternal thing. And so faith will continue to live on past you and me. God will honor faith in the earth even after we've died and moved on. See how the scriptures kept saying he was dead. They were dead. Their bodies were already dead. Like Abraham and Sarah's dead bodies, being dead doesn't change a thing. Hebrews 11.13 says this. this. Hebrews 11 is the Scripture's faith hall of fame. It says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. They were persuaded, they embraced it, and they confessed because that's what faith does. That's what faith is. Abraham was said to be fully persuaded. Okay, when we are fully persuaded, that's it. Okay, there's, there's no other option. Okay, there's no plan B for you. You know what you've heard. You know what God said. And you're not going to back off of it. Still in Hebrews chapter 11, let me read verses 35 to 40. It says, women received their dead raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Faith in the earth helps to promote us in the afterlife. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Yes, moreover, bonds of imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. They were tempted. They were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God having provided 
some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. Okay, faith in God's promises transcends our natural lives. The faith of those who went before us, the scripture just said those who had not received their promises in the earth, the faith of those now make up in that great cloud of witnesses, their faith is still at work in the earth today. And their faith is still producing harvests that they believed and they died believing. You see, even death is not the finish line for true faith. True faith is eternal and true faith never quits. Okay, for the believer, quitting and giving up should never be an option. It is quite possible to start well in the beginning of your faith and then give up. And I think that probably happens more times than not. But true faith will persevere through the trials and through hardships. Faith chooses to believe what God has said, even when everything else looks the opposite of what he said. Faith is not moved by what it sees. Faith is not moved by bad reports. We are to walk by faith, not by sight. You don't look at the circumstances and decide whether or not you're going to be in faith. And if we refuse to quit, if we refuse to give up, we will see answers to prayer. Okay, even if some of those answers have to be witnessed by us in heaven after we pass on. Just because your body died doesn't mean that your faith died. And it doesn't mean that your prayers died. God is a faithful God even to a thousand generations. He works generationally, and your faith and your prayers work generationally. So the church has to begin seeing faith like this. They have to start seeing faith as the long game. Faith says that unless God tells me something different, I won't quit. I won't back up. I refuse to let go of God's promises to me. I refuse to let go of God's promises to my children. I read to you Hebrews 4.1 that said, Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left of us entering into his rest, and any of you should seem to come short of it. Okay, we don't want to come short. We don't want to come up short. Okay, and the only way we come up short is by quitting. True fear of the Lord says, Let us therefore fear. True fear of the Lord means that no matter what happens, what God says is what goes as far as you're concerned. You look at it like what, whatever God spoke to me is what's going to come to pass. And that's the end of the matter forever. And if we take any other position than this, we risk coming short of his promises. So fear of God looks like faith. Unbelief is rooted in demonic fear. Okay, Satan comes after our faith by speaking lies, speaking fear to try to get us to quit. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says this, For all of the promises of God in him are yes, and in him amen, unto the glory of God by us. What this verse is saying is that whatever God promised has already been eternally affirmed in heaven with a royal decree from the throne of it's granted. Amen means so be it. It's done. It's granted. So be it. Make it so. Make it so, number one. All right, God is faithful to us. And we have to get that settled in our hearts, that he's faithful. And if you don't, then when the wind comes, when the waves come, and when things get hard, we'll faint if we don't have it settled. But the Lord said in his word that we will reap. Didn't say you might reap. You will reap in due season if you don't faint. And that just simply means we don't quit. We don't throw away what he said. So don't quit. Quitting must not be an option for a faithful follower of Christ. Okay, Jesus said to us he would never leave us nor forsake us 
even until the very end of the age. That means Antichrist time, up to the millennium. He will never leave you. Up to death, he will never forsake you. He's faithful. He promised that he would go with us all the way. So we have to be of the same mindset that no matter what comes, we are going to go all the way with Jesus, even if it comes to the end of our life. You have to play this the long game. It's, it's like marriage. It's supposed to be till death do us part. Faith is the same way. Now, you and I know that Satan is going to try whatever he can to try to get you to give up and to quit. All right. He doesn't want to see answers to prayer. All right. He doesn't want faith to produce anything of God in the earth because every gift from God is a good gift to us, and so that's bad for him. So when faith has come to us by rhema, and like Mark eleven twenty three 23 and 24 says, we receive the promise, uh, we believe that we receive it even before we have it, before we see it. And that faith has come into our heart. Satan knows it. He knows true faith. Like the parable of the sower, the parable of the soils, you know, the seed that was, this is not in my notes, seed that was sown on stony ground, he snatched that up immediately. He knew there was not going to be any faith there. He stole it before it ever it went into the ground. The next three soils were the only ones that would have produced. And those are the ones that he came after. So when faith has come by rhema, we believe that we receive that promise even before we see it. And Satan will come to try to steal the harvest before it can produce. But he can't stop the answer. He can only tempt you to give up and to forfeit your answer before you get it, before it comes to you. So he comes to talk us out of it. All right, well, just like faith comes by hearing the rhema of God, which will bring a good harvest, the opposite's also true. Fear and doubt and unbelief comes to you by hearing and hearing by the rhema of Satan, his, his words spoken to you, if you'll listen to him. So don't listen to him, okay? Don't let him plant tares of, of worry and doubt and unbelief into the soil of your heart, because if you do, then those seeds will grow up and it will choke out your faith. But if you will watch over your heart, keep it clean with the word, keep it clean with prayer, keep it soft towards God, keep the tares out, then the end of your faith will become sight. You will see the promises of, of God come to pass. You will see your answers to prayer. And that's why we were warned in Hebrews 10, 23, it says, Hold fast, hold on to it, the profession or the confession of your faith without wavering. For he, for God, is faithful that promised. There is a war for your faith. And because we have this enemy, we have to guard our hearts diligently in order to see our expected end. When anything comes to tell you that God doesn't hear you, or that God doesn't answer your prayers, or that God doesn't heal you, or that God doesn't prosper you, you will have to cast that down. Those are tares. That is the enemy trying to talk you out of your faith. You cannot listen to that stuff and expect that your faith will not be affected by it. So faith must be guarded. And you cast down those lies just like Jesus did in the wilderness when he was tempted of Satan. And he spoke to him what the word says. It is written. It is written. He spoke to the enemy. He spoke the word and he cast it down. You have to be ready for that. We are warned in scripture to guard our hearts from the enemy's lies. And we do that by meditating on what God has said instead of what the enemy is saying. And even what our eyes might be seeing at the time. You really have to guard what you listen to what you see, what you hear. And then we have to use the Word of God to cast down those thoughts that don't line up with what God said. And, of course, we never quit. We never quit. So we have to guard the eyes, guard the ears, and guard our own mouths. Meditate on the truth of the Word. Keep it before your eyes and speak the Word only. And then using our mouths... When vain imaginations, when high thoughts come against you, when the lies of the enemy shows up, they're trying to choke. They're trying to displace 
that word of promise. Use your mouth, cast it down. Use the word. All right, Colossians 2.8 says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. All right, Satan will try to use people to talk you out of your promises. He'll use good people. He will use well-meaning people. He'll use friends who are just trying to look out for you in your best interest because you're not smart enough to know any better in their eyes. Okay, but if you let their words get down inside of you, they will choke out your faith. Be careful who you allow to speak into your life. Faith doesn't quit. Faith doesn't quit. Laziness quits. Laziness will quit. Hebrews 6, 11, and 12 says, And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that you be not slothful. In other words, don't be lazy. But followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Impatience is an outflow of, of laziness. Lazy people are always in a hurry. Okay, they don't take the time to to slow down enough to do a good job because they just want to hurry up and be done with it. And so it is with those just like that who give up on their word from God. That there's a lack of patience and they just want to get on with it. Faith has to endure to the end. We have to stay patient until the end of the thing comes. Offended people will quit on the promises of God. Satan will lie and tell them that it's not working and that God didn't hear them and that they really didn't hear God. And then he'll send people along to reinforce that. And he'll send along some bad circumstances to reinforce that until you get angry, until you get offended. And those lies and the circumstances will get down on the inside It causes people to become offended with God when they don't see it happening right away. Mark 4, 17 says, And they have no root in themselves, and so they endure but for a time. And afterward, when affliction or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. All right, when people have no patience to carry their faith to the end, They get offended with God when they don't see it quickly enough, and they quit. Now, Jesus called this the stony soil of the heart. This is, again, from the parable of the sower. In other words, their heart is still carrying a certain hardness towards God, and specifically concerning or believing in his faithfulness. So when things start to look like they're going to go the wrong way, or it didn't happen like they thought it should, or it didn't happen quickly enough, They get mad at God and they quit. And that seed of faith that was planted in them by God will die and never produce the intended result. Being prayerless is another cause of crop failure. Things that God promised us must still be prayed over. We are to pray heaven into earth. God needs his people to stand fast with prayer until things are done. Nothing happens in this earth without the prayers of his saints. But people get tired and they quit. And when the prayer stops, the seed of faith will die before producing fruit. We have to be tenacious in prayer. We have to lay hold of promises by faith with prayer. We have to believe what God said and contend for it. And part of that just looks like thanking him for it. You heard the word, you believe it. When you go to pray, you're not necessarily asking him over and over. If you received it, continuously bring it up with thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, that this is happening in my life. It also means that we should be praying for wisdom. 
steps are always required on our part. There's things that we're supposed to do. We're partners with heaven. So we should be continually seeking God daily for wisdom on how to walk things out, how to walk out the promises. Sometimes he'll tell you to do something. Sometimes he'll tell you to wait. You need to know. And this takes patience. It takes perseverance. You cannot get tired and quit. Quitting cannot be an option for you. I'm going to read another parable from Luke chapter 18. If you want to follow along, starting in verse 2. And read 2 to 8. This is a parable of Jesus about um, an unjust judge. Chapter 18, verse 2 says, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city. And she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she wearies me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him? Though he bears long with them, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? Interesting ending. Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on the earth? Well, what did he mean in the context of that parable? The faith part is the diligence. It was the continuing to seek out the judge for help. And Jesus said, even this unjust judge, so we know we can't be talking about the father, who, who cared nothing about the woman, he gave her what she asked for because she wouldn't stop pestering him. And so how much more will God, the just judge, avenge us to give us what we are asking for in prayer? And so Jesus says, this is what faith looks like. Is this what I'm going to find when I come back? Faith perseveres. Okay, faith never quits. So faith prays continuously. Faith watches over the word. Faith casts down lies of the enemy when they come to steal it. Faith refuses to grow weary in, in doing well. Your enemy's desire is for you to grow tired and to quit. Listen to what the angel spoke to the prophet Daniel. He was talking to Daniel about the end times. He was showing him end of days, you know, revelation stuff, antichrist. And in Daniel chapter 7, the angel was talking to Daniel about these end times. And the angel says, uh, he's talking about the antichrist specifically, which we know the spirit of antichrist is already here and at work. And the angel said to Daniel in, in verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 25, He's talking about the Antichrist. He said, he shall speak great words against the Most High, and he shall wear out the saints of the Most High. He shall wear them out. And he will think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time. That probably means three and a half years. We won't get into that. All right, but the judgment, or in other words, but the judge, the just judge, shall, shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion, talking about Antichrist, to consume and destroy unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Okay, that's you and me. Whose kingdom is, a, is an everlasting kingdom. And all dominions shall serve and obey him. Everyone's going to have to bow their knee to Jesus. This Antichrist spirit, the spirit of this age, desires to wear you out and cause you to quit. But he's a loser. You just, you just heard, he's, he's the loser. So why would you be listening to him? Quitting is not an option. It's not an option if you want to please God by faith. Lynn and I, we went to the movies this last week, and we saw Black Adam 
and uh, I will not spoil it for you. But I will say I, I can't really fully recommend this for everybody. Um, I, you know, when we first got into the movie, I just, again, not to spoil it, but I, I did not appreciate a lot of the demonic imagery, you know, the blatant witchcraft. I told Lynn, I said, you know, at least Hollywood isn't trying to cover it. They're not trying to hide it anymore. They're not trying to just slip it in. I mean, it's, it's, it's big and blatant, right? And again, I, I don't want to spoil anything if you wanted to see the movie, but I'll just say when the evil villain takes the seat of power, Okay, and if you when you see the movie, you'll know what I'm talking about. When he takes the seat of power, it, it's really obvious that this is a picture of like Antichrist. You know, it's it's a it's fictional, but it's there there are parallels. It's a parable, right? Definitely looks like Antichrist taking the seat. Uh, but during that scene, that's all I'll say about it. But during that scene, I felt the Holy Spirit say to me in the movie, He said. The Antichrist will be seated just long enough to be judged. Antichrist will be seated just long enough to be judged. And that's true. The, the Antichrist is going to, this is, this is all bonus round stuff. I'm done with the teaching. All right? But the Antichrist will only come to power long enough to be judged by Jesus. So don't even worry about it. You want to hear a couple of more bonus scriptures about the Antichrist in this? I'll give you just a couple more. Revelation 12, 12 says, Therefore rejoice, be happy, right? You heavens and you that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the seal, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has but a short time. He has but a short time. All right. Revelation chapter 17, start at verse 10. It says, um, and there were seven kings, five are fallen. One is, and the other is not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven. And he goes into perdition. And I know nobody understands all this. <laughs> and then the ten horns which you saw are the ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet but will receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Short time, very short time. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords and king of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. So this is, this is just a good place to close on this. All right, the bad guys are going to eventually take the seat of power, but it will be just long enough to be judged by the king of kings, by the Lord of lords, and it says by the ones who will be with him who are called chosen and faithful. Hey, that's you. That's us. We get to kick the Antichrist butt with Jesus. So how cool is that? Amen. Friend, if you've never made Jesus your Savior and Lord, would you please do it today? You can't afford to put it off one more minute. Your eternal destiny depends on knowing Jesus. Whatever situation you may be in, Jesus can take your life and make something beautiful of it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father, except that He comes through me. And Romans 10, 9 tells us that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and we believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead, that we shall be saved. So if you would like to know Him, repeat this prayer with me today, and really mean it from your heart. Say after me, Jesus, I choose this day to make you Lord of my life. I believe that you are the Son of God, sent to the earth to pay the price for my sin by your death. I believe that you were raised from the dead and that you are alive today in heaven. Please take my life and do something great with it. Friend, if you prayed that prayer with me today and you meant it, then today is your birthday. 
Today is the day that you were born again into eternal life. We suggest that you find a good Bible-believing local church where you can connect with other Christian believers and grow in the Lord. Thanks again for tuning into our podcast. This message has been brought to you today free of charge by the friends and ministry partners of Renaissance Christian Fellowship. If you've been blessed by this ministry, would you please consider partnering with us to help send the gospel message to others around the world? For more information on how to donate to this ministry, please visit our Facebook page, www.facebook.com forward slash rcfworld, or you may send us an email at contact us at rcfworld.org. Again, that's contact us at rcfworld.org. You may give by debit or credit card directly at paypal.me forward slash rcfworld. Again, that's paypal.me forward slash rcfworld. RCF World. Thank you for helping us to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world.